Welcome to Fanfiction Audiobook, Marvel's Hogwarts Wizards. Chapter 66. This room of requirement is really amazing. After closing the door of the room of requirement, Jerry couldn't help letting out a heartfelt exclamation as he watched the smooth iron door disappear and the white walls return to their original state. He felt that the room of requirement felt like a magic house that had been cast with super transforming spells, legilimency spells, and traceless stretching spells. It can read the thoughts of the entrant, and then conjure various needed items according to the requirements, and can also extend various rooms. Maybe it was secretly made by one of the four great wizards who founded the school. However, it doesn't matter who created the room of requirement. What is important is that now that he owns the room of requirement, he will have a place to study and practice black magic in the future. After studying magic for so long, Jerry has already understood that it is not so easy to become a powerful wizard. Even if he has the cheating method of refreshing the mind, he still needs to work hard to achieve something. Of course, if he just wanted to study for seven years and graduate with honors like ordinary little wizards, it must be a very simple matter. But in that case, his strength is about the same as some orers in the Ministry of Magic. This is definitely not what he wants. What he wanted was to have at least as much strength as Lao Deng and Lao Fu before graduating from the 7th grade. He wants to equalize the peak strength of two magical wizards who have never seen each other in a thousand years. How can it be done without a little hard work? It's past 12 midnight now. There was no sound in the entire Hogwarts castle. Even the wizard teaching the troll to dance and the trolls chasing the wizard's hammer on the giant carpet opposite the white wall were lying in the grass and sleeping, caught. Not everyone is asleep, though, like a certain pair of restless Gryffindor twins. Good evening, good evening. As soon as he reached the stairs on the eighth floor, Jerry bumped into the Weasley brothers who came out of the Gryffindor public restroom in an embarrassing manner. According to Hogwarts school rules, after the curfew, little wizards are not allowed to leave the dormitory for night tours in the castle. If they are caught, not only will they be deducted points, but they will also be locked up. But now Jerry, a freshman in Slytherin, and Weasley, two Gryffindor seniors, bumped into each other on the 8th floor stairs after midnight. Didn't you just say that there is no one on the 8th floor? Big brother Fred asked George in a low voice. George shrugged helplessly. Just now, the Marauder's map shows that Mrs. Norris is on the 6th floor, and Filch is on the 2nd floor, but there is no new Slytherin. What they didn't know was that Jerry was still in the Room of Requirement just now, and the Marauder's map couldn't show the people in the Room of Requirement, so George didn't see Jerry on the Marauder's map just now. You two can't sleep and want to go downstairs. Jerry thought for a while, since everyone violated the school rules, there is actually no big problem. Ah. That's right, you're the Slytherin freshman Jerry, aren't you? Fred obviously thought of something with Jerry, and his expression immediately relaxed. Same as the two, I can't sleep and come out for a walk, but now I'm going back. Jerry replied with a smile. For Jerry, a first-year Slater freshman, Fred and George also learned something from his younger brother Ron, so seeing Jerry's good attitude, they didn't show their dislike for Slytherin. Then let's go together. It is good. So, after a brief exchange, Jerry and the two brothers walked down the magic stairs. Meow, woo. Just when the three of them went down to the seventh floor, a familiar cat shadow blocked their way. It was when the three of them were talking just now that Mrs. Norris, who had already patrolled the sixth floor, came to the seventh floor. Okay, it's you again, and there are two more accomplices. I just ate two fish, and I'm already full. I won't be bribed by you again. I'll report to the master and arrest you all. Mrs. Norris glanced at Jerry, and immediately turned around to find Filch on the second floor. No, it's going to find Filch, retreat quickly. The Weasley brothers obviously had a lot of experience, so they had to retreat to the Gryffindor common room immediately, and find other opportunities to come out. Don't worry, I have a solution. Brother Weasley can retreat to the Gryffindor common room, but he, a Slytherin, can't follow him to the Gryffindor common room. Fortunately, he was also prepared for this, and took out the glass bottle that he had prepared in advance without any panic, then grabbed a handful of green powder from it, and sprinkled it on Mrs. Norris. Mrs. Norris, who was about to step away, seemed to smell something, her body froze suddenly, 
Then she turned around and rushed towards the green powder that fell on the ground behind her, and began to quickly lick it. What is this? Meow. I feel so high. Immediately afterwards, Freddie and George were stunned to see another side of Mrs. Norris that had never been shown to them. After licking the green powder, Mrs. Norris first began to shake her head, as if she was dancing disco after drinking too much, and then she kept rolling on the ground, her expression gradually collapsed. In the end, like a cigarette afterward, he lay on the ground feeling powerless, and his eyes gradually became hollow. What did you feed it? It will be fine. If something happens to Mrs. Norris, Filch will kill us. Fred and George looked at Mrs. Norris, as if they had discovered a new world, and looked curiously and nervously at the glass bottle in Jerry's hand. A kind of herbal powder that cats especially like. It is not harmful to the body. Well, it may take a while to enjoy it before returning to normal. Let's go. Jerry didn't elaborate, but raised his foot and stepped past Mrs. Norris, and walked straight downstairs. The green powder in his bottle can also be said to be a kind of herb, but it is not a rare herb in the wizarding world, but a very common catnip for cat owners in the muggle world. It was specially prepared by him for Mrs. Norris. In the future, he will often swim to the room of requirement to practice magic at night, and in his Superman mode, he doesn't need to pay attention to people like Filch or Squibs. Because of his footsteps, Jerry can hear clearly no matter how far away he is. But unlike Luo Lisi, as a cat, its feet are born with cat mats that can eliminate noise, and it walks silently. Even if his five senses are keen, he may not be able to detect it in advance. Therefore, in order to deal with Mrs. Norris, he spared time in the main world and went to the pet store to buy a can of catnip powder. Unexpectedly, this came in handy as soon as I came back. We'll stop here. Filch is patrolling the second floor. Be careful when you go back. After the contact just now, the Weasley brothers feel that Jerry is indeed similar to what his younger brother Ron said, a different Slytherin. And the key opponent seems to have a talent for tricks, and they have a kindred spirit with them, so when we parted ways on the fourth floor, I kindly reminded Jerry. Thank you, I'll keep an eye out. Jerry glanced at the location on the fourth floor, then nodded, and continued to walk downstairs. It's only been 10 days since the start of school, and the Weasley brothers couldn't help being curious. Are they going to visit the restricted area on the fourth floor? Also, at the school opening feast, Dumbledore personally declared the fourth floor is a restricted area, and any little wizard who went there would be courting death, so how could the Weasley brothers, these two daring fellows, hold back their curiosity and not sneak a peek? I didn't go there immediately on the night of the school opening banquet, which is considered very good. However, I don't know if these two can successfully walk in front of the three-headed dog like the three of Harry. Yes, it shouldn't be that smooth, maybe they might not even be able to get in the first door. Jerry is not interested in the fourth floor adventure of the Weasley brothers. Because of course he knew about the secrets on the fourth floor, but the things inside were not something he could plan with his little magical ability now. It's better to be honest and pragmatic about your own magic theory, and find a way to learn more useful spells. Turning on the Superman mode, flexibly avoiding Filch who was patrolling on the second floor, Jerry came to the entrance of the Slytherin dungeon. Noble, saying the command, he stepped into the Slytherin common room, which had been out for a month. September 11th, Sunday, morning, in the Great Hall on the first floor of Hogwarts. Jerry sat on the long table in Slytherin, eating pumpkin porridge gracefully with a spoon, while concentrating on reading, strange magic puzzles and their solutions, that he had borrowed from the library before. Most of the other little Slytherin wizards were excited about the broomstick lesson that was coming up in the afternoon. The most conspicuous one was little Malfoy. At this time, he was proudly telling all kinds of stories that happened when he was riding a broomstick before entering school. For example, one extremely narrow escape from a muggle helicopter. Anyway, they were just bragging words, and the other little wizards were also not to be outdone, telling how amazing their broomstick riding skills were. Daphne, you're peeking at Jerry again. Pansy, with short hair, glanced slyly at the other side of the long table, Jerry, who was concentrating on reading, bumped into Daphne next to him. Daphne blushed slightly and said, What is peeking, I'm looking at it openly. Pansy laughed softly when he heard this. There are only four girls in Slater's freshmen, 
and of course they are assigned to a dormitory, so the relationship is still very good. However, I heard from Della that Jerry seems to have a good relationship with the freshman from Gryffindor, and he's also a traitor. After Pansy smiled, a hesitant look appeared on his face again. But Daphne immediately responded angrily. Della Kona is jealous of Jerry's excellence. Jerry is not a traitor. You don't understand Jerry's ambitions at all. He doesn't need to fight against those people in Gryffindor, because he has never put Gryffindor people in his eyes. He is the best. Actually, I don't think he is a traitor. At least he has earned a lot of credits for Slytherin. Now Slytherin's credits are the first among the four colleges. Pansy nodded approvingly. She and Della Kay have known each other since they were young, and they know that Della Kay is relatively competitive. It may be that Jerry's performance has completely overwhelmed him during the beginning of school, so he said that. However, she didn't fully believe what Daphne said. It's only been 11 days since school started, and it will take time to test whether Jerry is as good as Daphne said. The little wizards of Slytherin are proud, and only those who are far superior to them can lead them. However, in the broomstick class in the afternoon, your Jerry probably won't stand out anymore. At this moment, Pansy suddenly thought of something, and raised an eyebrow at Daphne with a smile. During this period of time, Pansy already knew that Jerry was not a child of a famous wizard family at all, but came from a muggle orphanage, but the parents may be wizards, or one of them may be a wizard. This also means that Jerry had never touched a broomstick before. As for the children of the wizard family, which ones have not been exposed to flying broomsticks since childhood, they should not be too familiar with them. Although Delicay's experience is mostly bragging, his broomstick riding skills are definitely not bad. In the broomstick class, it is probably difficult for Jerry to have any outstanding performance. And she also heard from Delico that she should have a good laugh at Jerry and the famous Harry Potter in the broomstick class. Hearing Pansy's words, Daphne frowned slightly, but quickly said firmly. Even if it is the first contact, I believe that Jerry is the best, he must be the best, no one can be better than him. Okay. Pansy shrugged speechlessly. But then she took another look at Jerry and laughed. He really does look like a real Slytherin, it's hard to imagine he was born in a muggle orphanage, maybe his parents were famous wizards. That's why he flowed the noble blood in their bodies to have such a noble temperament. Quote. If Jerry knew what Pansy was thinking at this time, he would definitely laugh. Ghost's noble temperament, he just doesn't like to drink pumpkin porridge, so he digs it slowly with a spoon and eats it. If it was a bowl of salty tofu now, he would have finished it in a hurry. At this moment, a large group of owl postmen swarmed along the windows of the auditorium, throwing envelopes and packages in front of the little wizards. It's time for the owl delivery every morning. Here, little Malfoy received the new magic candy from his mother, and immediately proudly showed it off to the gluttonous Goyle and Crab. Pansy looked at the little Malfoy who was showing off with candy everywhere, and then glanced at Jerry who was sitting there elegantly drinking pumpkin porridge and concentrating on reading, and shook his head helplessly. Della, compared to that Jerry, you really have no advantage except for your background. Oh, and maybe you have a broomstick. Girls always mature earlier than boys. In Pansy's view, Delico showing off with candy is a bit too childish. Even if he does well in broomstick class, it will be difficult to shake Jerry's current position in the hearts of all first-year Slytherins. But I still think Gore is the most handsome one. On the other side, the strong Millicent suddenly interjected. Pansy and Daphne rolled their eyes at the same time as they looked at the glib-mouthed Goyle. My memory ball. Malfoy, do you want to fight? A yelling sound pulled Jerry out of the ocean of magical knowledge. He turned his head and looked towards the place where the commotion took place. It turned out that when Malfoy passed by the Gryffindor long table, he snatched the memory ball that Neville's grandma had sent to Neville, and Harry and Ron were helping Neville. However, due to the timely arrival of Professor McGonagall, the conflict ended before it reached a climax. After closing the book and checking the time, Jerry got up and walked towards the Slytherin dormitory. There was transfiguration class in the morning, and he hadn't picked up the textbook yet. Some people think that since Jerry has already memorized all the contents of the transfiguration textbook and used all the spells in it, is there any point in attending the class? Jerry will tell you, of course it makes sense. It's like you have memorized the entire math book, 
and then you can use the formulas in it through self-study, but it is a truth that you still need to go to math class to listen to the teacher's explanation. Moreover, in terms of the complexity of magic, it is not much worse than mathematics. Under the teacher's explanation, many small details that were ignored during self-study will be discovered at this time, and many knowledge, experience and small skills that are not mentioned in these books will also be popularized by the teacher and class. Therefore, Jerry still attaches great importance to class, and he will listen to almost every class very carefully. Because only in this way can his magic foundation be solid enough. A tall building rises from the ground, and every brick and tile is the foundation. If you want to become a top-level wizard like Dumbledore, if you don't lay a solid enough foundation, it is definitely impossible to become a magician. Self-study, attending classes, and communicating with classmates are all indispensable bricks and tiles for building tall buildings. Half past three in the afternoon. The sun is shining and the breeze is gentle, which is a very suitable day for riding a broomstick. Jerry and a group of little Slytherin wizards came to the big lawn at the gate of the castle together, and there, twenty broomsticks had already been placed in advance. It's just that the twenty broomsticks looked a bit worn out, and even some branches were stuck out in all directions, which seemed to be worse than his sweeping three-star broomstick. After a while, Jerry saw Hermione, Harry and other Gryffindor wizards coming from the castle, followed by their broomstick teacher Ms. Hooch. Ms. Hooch looked to be in her early thirties, with short gray hair and sharp yellow eagle-like eyes. Jerry felt that there might be some eagle-like magical animal blood flowing in her body. Okay, what are you all waiting for? Everyone stand next to a broomstick. Quick, quick, hurry up. As soon as Ms. Hooch arrived, she immediately urged the little wizards to stand beside the two rows of broomsticks. Gryffindor had eleven and Slytherin had nine, so Hermione was temporarily placed next to Jerry. Hold your hands tightly, move your body forward, don't keep looking down, look forward, don't be nervous, don't be nervous, I'm not nervous, I'm not nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. Jerry looked at Hermione next to him, and kept chanting the flying skills recorded in, the amazing Quidditch, in a low voice, while his tense body trembled slightly, and he couldn't help but want to laugh. However, he still comforted in a low voice with a slow tone. Hermione, it's okay, it's just a broom, let's not fly so high for a while, take your time. But I've never ridden a broomstick before. Hearing the comfort from her best friend, Hermione stopped talking, but there was still a worried look on her face. Jerry nonchalantly said without batting an eye. It's okay, I haven't ridden it before, it's the first time, just ride it a few more times in the future. At this time, Ms. Hooch also came among the young wizards and began to explain the magic spells and some usage skills of controlling the broomstick. After the theory is finished, the next step is practice. Stretch out your right hand, put it on top of the broomstick, and say the spell. At Mrs. Hooch's command, all held out their right hands and read in unison. Two puffs. As the spell took effect, everyone's broomsticks also started to move. Some flew directly into the hands, such as Jerry, Malfoy and Harry, etc., some just rolled on the ground, such as Hermione, Dean, Parvati, and some remained motionless on the ground, such as Neville and Seamus. Hermione, your mind must be firm and strong, and you must convey to it an emotion that if you don't get up, if you don't obey, I'll chop you up and use it as firewood. Seeing that Hermione didn't let the broomstick get up several times in a row, Jerry's eyes were red with anxiety, and he quickly taught her his unique skills. Jerry is very experienced in flying broomsticks, after all, he has been flying on it for a month. And he was the same as Hermione at the beginning, and later through the refreshing function, he was keenly aware of the shortcut to mastering the broomstick. That is the transmission of emotions. The broomstick is also bullying and fearful. The more nervous and timid you are, the more disobedient it will be. The more determined and tough you are, the more it will be persuaded. Sure enough, with the help of Jerry's tricks, Hermione quickly mastered the method and let the broomstick fly into her hand successfully. On the other side, Daphne, who had already picked up the broomstick, saw Jerry carefully teaching Hermione's skills, and suddenly thought she made a mistake. She shouldn't have picked up the broomstick so quickly just now. Half an hour later, under Mrs. Hooch's careful guidance, the last Neville also managed to pick up the broomstick. Okay, as soon as I whistle, 
You kick your legs off the ground and kick hard. Mrs. Hooch came to the front of the crowd with a whistle. Hold the broom steady, go up a few feet, then lean forward slightly and drop straight back to the ground. Listen to my whistle, three, two. However, before Mrs. Hooch could blow the whistle, Neville, who was too nervous, kicked his feet hard and shot straight up like a rocket. In the blink of an eye, Neville's flying height exceeded the few feet that Ms. Hooch had just mentioned, and reached a height of more than 10 feet, and even 20 or 30 feet later, that is, a height of more than 10 meters. Then, his face turned pale, his hands softened, and he yelled, slipped off the broom, and quickly smashed to the ground under the force of gravity. Due to the suddenness of the incident, even Mrs. Hooch did not react. However, just as everyone was exclaiming, a figure, swiped, from the ground soaring into the sky, like a sharp arrow, rushing towards the place where Neville fell. It turned out that not everyone didn't react, at least Jerry, who had expected it for a long time, responded in time. In other words, this wizard's body, strength, speed and other aspects are not much stronger than normal people, but his vitality is definitely tenacious. Jerry was riding on a broomstick, and seeing Neville hitting the ground from a height of more than 10 meters, he couldn't help sighing. If he remembered correctly, after Neville hit the ground, he only suffered some minor injuries. Ms. Hooch helped him to the school hospital for treatment, and he fully recovered in the evening. If it was a normal person, let alone a child, even a stronger adult, it would probably be enough for him to fall from a height of more than 10 meters. After fine-tuning the angle of the broomstick, Jerry swooped down and snatched up Neville's school uniform, which was falling. Catch it! Seeing this, the little wizards below let out a burst of exclamation. But at this time, Neville's weight and the strong falling gravity made Jerry, who was holding him, lose his balance all of a sudden, and was about to be taken and fell off the broomstick. Let Ms. Hooch and the little wizards below scream again. However, whoever Jerry is, he has encountered this kind of situation, and riding a broomstick before saved those who committed suicide by jumping off the building. As soon as he turned on the Superman mode, his body shook violently, and his feet hooked on the broomstick, immediately converting the force of his fall into a rushing force, pulling Neville on the broomstick to hit several big ones in a row. Turntable. After removing all the strength, he pulled Neville to sit on the broomstick again. I said Neville, you should lose weight. Jerry regained control of the broomstick, and while controlling the broomstick to adjust its direction and fly to the ground, he smiled at Neville who was being carried in his hand. At this time, Neville's face had lost all trace of fright, and he didn't answer Jerry's question, but cried out with a, wow, with a lot of tears and snot in his nose. If Jerry hadn't saved him just now, he really thought he was going to die. Riding a broomstick and steadily placing Neville on the lawn, Jerry turned over and jumped off the broomstick, and the two of them were instantly surrounded by little wizards. Mrs. Hooch and the little wizards of Gryffindor were mostly concerned about comforting Neville, while the little wizards of Slytherin didn't care about Neville's life and death, but looked at Jerry with admiration. Although most of the little wizards in Slytherin have been exposed to flying broomsticks since they were young, the top pair is just flying in the yard, and the height is only about 3 or 4 meters. Things like the helicopter that almost hit the muggles were just some self-proclaimed jokes. A little wizard who has not learned the disillusionment charm is not allowed to ride a broomstick in the muggle world at all. The law of secrecy is no joke. Unless, like the Weasleys, they live in very remote places. Therefore, Jerry's thrilling broomstick rescue operation just now was too powerful in their eyes. This is not bragging, but a real live broadcast. Especially the movement of the big turntable of the broomstick just now is an unheard of technique, so cool. They even felt that, even in previous World Quidditch tournaments, they hadn't seen anyone able to perform such a difficult technique. Clamping a broomstick between two feet and twirling in the air while holding one in hand, is this really a movement that a human can do? Mr. Carmen just relied on his superb broomstick skills to save Mr. Longbottom who made a mistake very bravely. Very good, very good. I want to give Slytherin 10 points. Seeing that Neville was only a little overly frightened and had no physical damage, Mrs. Hooch heaved a long sigh of relief, then looked at Jerry and announced loudly. As a flight teacher, if Neville died because of this, she would definitely be responsible, and she would never forgive herself in her heart. So for Jerry's behavior of saving Neville, Ms. Hooch is also grateful from the bottom of her heart.
The key point is that Jerry's skill in riding a broom just now also impresses her. It's the first time she rides a broom, and she has such a level. This potential is definitely a good player in the future Quidditch field. Awesome. Slater Lin Yi added 10 points all of a sudden, and all the little Slytherin wizards, including the little Malfoy, couldn't help applauding. If a person is as good as you, you will still try to compare with him, but if he is so good that you feel a little desperate, your thoughts may slowly change. At this moment, Jerry made little Malfoy feel this way. In terms of learning ability, Jerry is the best in all subjects, even his best potion class is inferior to Jerry. In terms of magical ability, Jerry has been able to release all the spells in the textbooks in the transformation and charms classes, but he, who has a solid foundation, can't master one-third of them. In terms of fighting, Jerry alone can beat him plus Gore and Crab, and they are completely defeated. Now even the only broomstick he thought he could beat Jerry had little hope of winning, especially since it was the first time the other party had come into contact with a broomstick today. How can this compare? He had always disliked Harry, and opposed Harry because Harry had a great reputation for defeating the Dark Lord, but he didn't feel that he was such a genius. He even felt that Harry was inferior to him in many aspects, especially Potion's class. The most important point is that as a wizard of a pure blood family, he did not enter Slytherin but went to Gryffindor. He would rather be friends with the traitors of Weasley than the noble him. Well, let me just say that Jerry is absolutely the best. At this moment, Daphne and Slytherin glanced at Pansy proudly. Pansy looked at Jerry, who was still smiling under the applause of the crowd, and couldn't help but nodded. I admit, he is indeed a bit different. The little Gryffindor wizard on the other side clapped his hands even though he was a little disappointed when he heard Slytherin add 10 points. Because Jerry's behavior just now really made them very admired, and the other party saved their little Gryffindor wizard regardless of their own danger, so why should they not applaud? Wizards of Gryffindor don't have the virtue of being narrow-minded. Ten minutes later, the class returned to normal again. Because of the experience just now, Neville temporarily sat on the side to rest, while the other young wizards rode broomsticks and began to try at a height of two or three meters under the guidance of Mrs. Hooch. Flight. At this height, there is a soft lawn below, even if you fall down, it won't be a big deal. But everyone performed well, except for a few wobbly ones, the others were quite stable. Slow down, don't rush, yes, just hold on to the direction. Jerry rode a broomstick next to Hermione, carefully guiding her to fly, while Malfoy on the other side froze with Harry, who had just touched a broomstick for the first time. The two competed back and forth there. Although it was the first time for Harry to meet him, he was very talented, and he did not lose to Malfoy in every aspect, which made Malfoy very upset. It's okay to lose to Jerry, but he is absolutely unconvinced if he loses to Harry. Regarding the grievances between Malfoy and Harry, Jerry didn't interfere much. His goal is to concentrate on learning magic and strive to strengthen himself. Improving his status among the students is just to learn more magic more effectively. Instead of being a peacemaker, mediating the grievances and disputes between a few children, wouldn't that be a pain in the ass? The flying lesson is over, and it's already six o'clock. Jerry came to the auditorium with the little wizards and enjoyed a sumptuous dinner that had already filled the tables. To be honest, the food at Hogwarts is pretty good overall. Although it is not as extravagant as the opening banquet, there are not a few meat dishes in every meal and beef, mutton and the like are almost available in every meal. After dinner, Jerry is preparing to go back to the dormitory to take a nap to recover from the overdrawn spirit of today's use of refreshing. Professor Snape, who was dressed in black wizard robes and had no expression on his face, suddenly blocked his way. Come with me. After leaving only a few words, Professor Snape turned and walked towards his office. Although Jerry was confused, he followed up honestly. The head of Slytherin's office is also on the basement level, on the same floor as the potions classroom and the Slytherin common room. The layout of the office was in line with Snape's personal image. Except for a desk, the entire office is filled with all kinds of animal and plant specimens and precious potion refining materials. At first glance, I thought it was in the material storage room for refining potions. But it also showed that Snape was really rich. It is estimated that most of these precious potion materials belong to him personally. 
Ms. Hooch told me about your performance in class just now. I heard that you dived from a height of more than 20 feet and caught that idiot from the Longbottom family in one go. Snape sat behind his desk, looking at Jerry sharply. Yes, I didn't think of it myself. When Jerry heard that it was about the broomstick class, he breathed a sigh of relief. He knew that Snape hated Gryffindor on the surface, but in fact, he still loved every little wizard in the school, and would not trouble him because he saved a Gryffindor wizard. Plus he earned 10 points for the Slytherins for it. You are riding a broom for the first time. Snape continued asking. Jerry nodded cheekily. Very well, Ms. Hooch told me that you are absolutely the most suitable Seeker student she has ever met, so I want you to join Slytherin's Quidditch team directly as Seeker. Snape didn't beat around the bush, but ordered directly. It seems that this grade cannot join Quidditch. Jerry hesitated. He doesn't really want to join Quidditch, because he thinks that if he has that time, he might as well spend it on studying magic to improve his strength. No matter how good Quidditch is, it's just an entertainment activity. Just like basketball, football, and badminton, no matter how good you practice, when it comes to fighting, you still can't beat others who practice Sonda. And he didn't remember Voldemort ever being a Quidditch player. You don't have to worry about that, I'll tell Dumbledore. Snape waved his hand. I heard that our Slytherin team seems to have been overwhelming the Gryffindor team all the time. It is already so good, there is no need for me to add another freshman. And I want to spend more time learning magic. Quote. Jerry expressed his thoughts a little bit. Snape nodded, he appreciated Jerry's studious spirit, but he didn't give up his previous plan. I have never paid attention to the Gryffindor team, and they have never won in the past few years of confrontation, but this does not mean that we Slytherin can win the first place every year. Last year, Hufflepuff was first, Slytherin was second, Gryffindor was third, and Lowen Kelua was fourth. I don't just want to win over Gryffindor, but Rawen Claw and Hufflepuff, so you're the new seeker. Quote. It turned out that although Slytherin has been suppressing Gryffindor in the past few years, it does not win the Quidditch Cup every time. Hufflepuff's team is also very good, especially their seeker Cedric Diggory. Seeing that Jerry was still hesitating, Snape continued to add. Nimbus 2000, as long as you are willing to serve as Slytherin's seeker, I will give you the latest Nimbus 2000. Make a deal. The Nimbus 2000 is the latest broomstick, its fastest speed is at least twice that of sweeping Samsung, and its steering, braking and other aspects are far superior to sweeping Samsung. Jerry knew very well that a broomstick with better performance might give him a little more chance of surviving in a dangerous battle like last time, since he hadn't learned operation yet. So when Snape said that he would give away a Nimbus 2000 for free, he decisively agreed. Snape. As expected, he is indeed an excellent Slytherin, once he heard that it would be beneficial, he agreed quickly enough. Follow me. Seeing that Jerry had agreed, Snape got up and led him to the Slytherin team captain Marcus Flint. Marcus Flint looks very strong. It is said that he may have the blood of a troll in his body. He is a fifth grade student and has just become the captain of the Slytherin team this year. He frowned when he heard that Snape was going to make Jerry, a freshman, the most important seeker. Dean, if he's the seeker, what about Terence Higgs? Terence Higgs was the former seeker for the Slytherin team. You guys lost to Hufflepuff last year, it shows he's not a good seeker, let him be a backup. Snape squinted his head and gave Marcus a bad look. Marcus's heart trembled suddenly, knowing that his question just now had made the dean a little unhappy, so he quickly replied. Okay. Then wait until Saturday, let Jerry come to the Quidditch training ground, and I will teach him some Quidditch rules. Snape nodded in satisfaction upon hearing this, and led Jerry back to the office. In fact, the reason why Snape believed in Jerry so much was not only because of Ms. Hooch's words, but also because he happened to see the scene where Jerry saved Neville. The Nimbus 2000 will be delivered in a few days, you can go back. After returning to the office, Snape let Jerry leave without saying anything. However, just as Jerry was about to leave the office, Snape's emotionless voice sounded behind him again. If you do well in Quidditch training, I will allow you to come here at night and ask me about magic. Jerry was still in a good mood when he left Snape's office. Originally, he tried to save Neville, just to earn a little red star, and Neville was already stupid enough to fall down like this. Unexpectedly, not only got a free Nimbus 2000, 
but also got Snape's promise that he could come to ask about magic at night time in the future. This is really going around and around, and it's back to the original plan. Originally, he wanted to join Gryffindor, not because Professor McGonagall could give him a Nimbus 2000, and by the way, he could have a relationship with Professor McGonagall for a small talk. Now, although I joined Slytherin by accident, I can also get the Nimbus 2000 and enjoy the benefits of being a small cook. It seems that he really deserves some snacks for the next Quidditch game. However, you can't waste too much time on it, you have to think of a way to kill two birds with one stone. Back in the Slytherin dormitory, before Jerry entered the door, he heard the triumphant laughter of the little Malfoy trio from inside. You can imagine, when the two idiots Potter and Weasley went to the prize showroom to fight us at night, and saw Filch there, what kind of wonderful expression would it be? Thinking about it, I'm special happy. I think that after the two of them are caught, even if they won't be expelled, they will definitely be locked up. No way, the people of Gryffindor have always been insane. I just said that, and they believed it. So, they are all idiots. When the three of them saw Jerry open the door and walk in, their laughter stopped abruptly, then they glanced at each other, left the dormitory very unnaturally, and went to the common room to continue the discussion. Seeing this, Jerry just shook his head and ignored them. Instead, he fell on the bed and began to catch up on his daily sleep. He didn't care about or prevent the three of them from trying to trick Harry and Ron, because it was completely unnecessary. Harry had Dumbledore as his backing, and no matter who it was, it was impossible to kick him out of school. In the eyes of the little wizard, violating the school rules may be something very terrifying and extraordinary, but in the eyes of the professors, it is actually nothing at all. No professor would expel little wizards for violating the curfew at night. If so, the Weasley brothers would have been expelled dozens of times. Every year, at least half of Gryffindor's students will be expelled before graduation, because they like to come out for adventure at night. Even Hufflepuff, who seems to be the most disciplined, will sneak out of the dormitory at night and go to the kitchen to get something to eat. At midnight, Jerry slowly opened his eyes. At this time, Malfoy and the others had already fallen asleep, Jerry got up quietly, picked up his wand and a can of catnip, and left the dormitory secretly. From now on, every night after 12 o'clock, he would go to the house of everything to practice magic in order to improve his proficiency in magic. Anyway, in the main world, he is also earning a little red star outside during this period of time, and he is used to it. Turning on the Superman mode, improving the five senses to prevent being discovered by Filch on patrol, Jerry walked along the magic stairs to the room of requirement on the eighth floor. What? Jerry had just reached the fourth floor when four terrified screams suddenly came from the end of the corridor on the fourth floor. Immediately afterwards, he saw Harry, Hermione, Ron, and Neville running out of the room at the end of the fourth floor with fear on their faces. What's the situation? Jerry immediately put a question mark on his head. He remembered that in the movie, it wasn't that Audio Technica was accidentally transferred to the fourth floor when walking the magic stairs during the day, and then entered it by mistake, and found Lu Wei, the three-headed dog, why it became after midnight now. And there was an extra Neville. Oh, yes, this is the world of novels. He suddenly remembered that this is the world of a novel, and some details might be different, so he was relieved. But then he sighed again, because since the four of Harry broke into the restricted area on the fourth floor at this time, it meant that Dumbledore was probably hiding nearby with the disillusionment charm. This also meant that today he could not go to the room of requirement to practice magic. What's wrong with you guys? Jerry took the initiative to stop Harry and the four of them asked. Jerry, there is a scary three-headed monster in the forbidden area on the fourth floor, let's run. The four of Hermione and Harry saw Jerry appearing, panting for breath while explaining in a panic. Calm down, calm down, the three-headed monster you mentioned didn't catch up. Jerry pointed to the corridor behind the four of them. The four looked back, and sure enough, the corridor on the fourth floor was empty, and the three vicious dogs were chained and did not run out chasing them. What the hell is going on? What kind of three-headed monster? Jerry feigned confusion. So the four told Jerry that they were chased by Filch into the restricted area on the fourth floor and found a huge three-headed vicious dog and a trapdoor inside. By the way, Jerry, why are you here? 
After finishing speaking, Hermione suddenly thought of something, and looked at Jerry in surprise. Jerry coughed dryly, and then started to fool around. That's right, I heard that you are going to have a magic duel with Decora at midnight, but at 12 o'clock, I don't think the three of them have any idea of getting up to duel with you. That's why I came here specially to inform you to go back to the dormitory as soon as possible so that Mr. Filch won't catch you. Quote. Look, I told Malfoy they lied to you, and you had to listen. Gryffindor almost got points deducted for your recklessness, and I almost got fired for you. Hermione yelled at Harry and Ron angrily. But Harry and Ron looked at each other, they didn't force Hermione out then, it's their fault now. Still, they thanked Jerry. Because Jerry actually risked being fired, it was really interesting to take the risk of notifying them to evacuate so late. Sure enough, although Jerry is a Slytherin, he is a trustworthy Slytherin. Okay, you guys go back quickly, I'm going back too, or Mr. Filch will come on patrol later, and it will be troublesome. Jerry looked around, his keen five senses made him faintly aware that a certain line of sight fell on him from midair, so he quickly opened his mouth to remind him. The four of Hermione and Harry also thought it made sense, greeted Jerry, and ran along the stairs towards the Gryffindor common room on the eighth floor. Seeing this, Jerry didn't stay long, turned around and returned to the Slytherin dormitory. Although he didn't go to the room of response today, he also knew that Dumbledore had really been monitoring Harry's every move. Be careful when you're with Harry in the future. On Saturday morning, the auditorium on the first floor. Hermione, go to the library first after you finish eating, don't wait for me, I have something to do, I'll be there in about half an hour. After breakfast, Jerry explained to Hermione in advance as he passed by the Gryffindor table. Last Saturday he made an appointment with Hermione to go to the library to read books this morning, but because of an accident on Thursday, he had to go to the Quidditch Stadium this morning to solve the problem of participating in Quidditch training in the future. However, if the plan goes well, he shouldn't need to waste too long there. The Quidditch pitch of Hogwarts is located between the castle and the Forbidden Forest. The area is as large as several football fields, and the auditorium on all sides is enough for thousands of people to sit and watch without being crowded. There are three gold poles at each end of the field, with rings on top, each of them is more than 10 meters high. Today, the Slytherin team specially applied for the Quidditch venue, so now only the wizards of the Slytherin team are conducting daily training on the venue. The tall and burly Captain Marcus, along with the other two Slater wizards, was conducting passing training. The ball in their hands was about 30 centimeters in diameter and bright red in color. From time to time they also throw the ball at the goalkeeper standing in the ring. On the other side, two Slater wizards were riding broomsticks, holding short clubs in their hands, and they were constantly hitting two black iron balls that were constantly attacking them. The black iron balls were a circle smaller than the red balls just now. There is also a wizard Slater below who did not participate in the training. He is sitting in the stands, and his expression does not seem to be very good. Okay, let's pause for a while and gather at my place. At this time, the Captain Marcus, who was passing the ball, also saw Jerry, and quickly waved his hand and shouted to the players. After a while, Marcus introduced to his six team members. This freshman, Jerry Kamen, is also our new seeker. Welcome. However, after Marcus's voice fell, None of the other six team members raised their hands to applaud, but all of them looked disdainful. It seemed to them a joke that a first-year freshman, who had never played a broomstick before, was the most important chaser on their team. Even if it was their terrifying headmaster Snape's decision, it didn't make them feel confident. It depends on you, if you want to replace me as the seeker, I think the dean is confused. At this time, the Slytherin wizard who was sitting in the stand sullenly said to Jerry with a mocking face. I also think the Dean is a bit too much this time. Although Senior Terence is not the top seeker, he has also earned a lot of honor for a Slytherin. We can't let this first year newborn egg to replace him. Another wizard Slater interjected, and Senior Terence will be graduating next year, and this year will be his last Quidditch competition. Hey, you are standing and talking without pain in your back. I also know that this matter is very inappropriate, but if you have the ability, go and talk to the Dean in person. See if the dean will send your souls to hell with black magic. 
Marcus rolled his eyes secretly when he heard the complaints from his teammates. Don't look at other people who are tall and burly and look very cruel, but they are still very cowardly in the face of Snape. It wasn't really that he was afraid that Snape would use black magic to punish him. In fact, this had never happened before. Snape would never use black magic to punish students, it was just his psychology. Just like when you were 11 or 12 years old, you met a teacher who made you feel very scary. Even if you grow up in the future, when you think about this teacher, you will still have some psychological shadows. Snape was like this, with a gloomy face all day long, exuding a dark and terrifying aura everywhere, and the potions class was even more severe, and he never showed mercy when he scolded the little wizard. For every first year freshman, it is a nightmare. So even though these little wizards were grown up in the 6th or 7th grade, when they faced Snape, they still trembled a little. This is a problem left over from history. Okay, since this is the dean's decision, it cannot be changed. The most important thing for us now is to spare more time for training. Before the first Quidditch game next month, we must train Jerry to become a slightly more qualified seeker. Marcus knew that it was useless to complain now, and only by training more could he win in future competitions. I'm sorry, Senior Marcus, I'm usually busy, so I may not be able to participate in your training. As Marcus tried to reassure the team, Jerry smiled and raised his hand. What did you say? The tall and burly Marcus stood in front of Jerry aggressively, his face full of anger. Good guy, I just said that I need to step up training, but you don't have time to train. You are a newbie and don't know anything, how can you have confidence? I said, I'm usually busy, and I may not have time to come and train with you. Jerry smiled and repeated it again. Immediately afterwards, he ushered in the seven original Slytherin team members, who condemned him violently. Stop, stop, seniors, listen to my explanation. Jerry slid backwards, avoiding the spittle of the seven seniors, and then said slowly. Do you see if this works? I know the rules of the Quidditch game very well, and the task of the Seeker is to throw everything away and catch the Snitch. Now, I'll make you a bet, if I can catch the Snitch three times in a row in five minutes, then I can skip training. If it doesn't work, I'll make it clear to Dean Snape myself and quit the team. Quote. Hearing Jerry's words, the seven Slytherin members, including Marcus, were all stunned. Catch the Snitch three times in a row within five minutes, aren't you kidding? Even the best seeker in the international Quidditch game, he couldn't catch the snitch in the first five minutes. Unless one day is very lucky, there is only a little possibility. How about it, better not. Jerry smiled again. Seven people replied at the same time. Bet. From their point of view, it might be that Jerry knew that he couldn't be a seeker, so he found a reason and quit. Five minutes later. Jerry held up his training broomstick and gestured to Marcus in the middle of the Quidditch field for an oak sign. Marcus opened the box, took out the training snitch, and let go. The golden snitch the size of a walnut immediately opened a pair of small silver wings, and then quickly fled across the entire Quidditch pitch. And Jerry also kicked his feet, turned on the, boosting brain, function, and rushed towards the golden snitch. Bring it to you. After a few sharp turns, Jerry in Superman mode grabbed the golden snitch. 3 minutes and 40 seconds. Marcus looked at the pocket watch in his hand and couldn't help rubbing his eyes. Impossible. The other six Slater team members exclaimed at the same time when they heard the time reported by Marcus. Catching the golden snitch in 3 minutes and 40 seconds is simply a joke. Even if it is not an official match, this data can definitely break the record. Luck. Definitely luck. Seeing Jerry returning with the snitch, the seven comforted themselves at the same time. It is impossible for a person who has just been exposed to flying broomsticks for a few days to catch the golden snitch in 3 minutes and 40 seconds with real skills. So, only luck can explain what just happened. Taking the snitch from Jerry with a smile, Marcus took a deep breath and threw the snitch into the air again. This time, the Slytherin team members were no longer as undisciplined as before, but all fixed their eyes on Jerry. They want to prevent Jerry from using magic to cheat when hunting the golden snitch. However, in their eyes, Jerry kicked his feet, accelerated on his broomstick, and just made a few turns in the air, and soon found the snitch. Immediately afterwards, the golden snitch, known for its speed and agility, was caught by Jerry's hand, which was as fast as lightning. 
3 minutes and 5 seconds. Marcus reported Jerry's time again, 35 seconds faster than the first time. This time, all the team members fell silent. If the first time is luck, then if you catch it the second time, the element of luck is already very low. And they also observed carefully just now, Jerry is definitely very proficient in operating the broomstick, and those few tactical flips and accelerations are beyond the reach of ordinary wizards. The most important thing is the subsequent catch of the snitch, which was fast, accurate, and ruthless, without the slightest sloppiness. I'm not as good as him. Terence, the seeker who had been with the Slytherin team for four years, couldn't help letting out a long sigh when he saw Jerry returning with the snitch. After receiving the snitch handed over by Jerry, Marcus threw it out for the third time with some numbness. 2 minutes and 45 seconds. The time has been shortened again, and it has been indented to 3 minutes, which is really terrible. Is this really something humans can do? Looking at the smiling Jerry, as if he didn't know what he was doing, how shocking Jerry was, the hearts of all the Slytherin players were mixed at this moment. On the one hand, they're delighted that they're about to have a super powerful seeker. On the other hand, compared to Jerry, a first-year freshman who has just learned about flying broomsticks, they feel that they have been practicing for nothing all these years, which is a bit of a blow to the proud Slytherin. How about it, seniors, I will win this bet. Jerry looked at the seven Slytherin players who were all in a dazed state, and reminded him softly. Marcus, who was the first to react, looked at Jerry with bright eyes. You won, you don't need to participate in all the Quidditch training in the future, as long as you appear in the game. As the new captain of the Slytherin team this year, Marcus can already imagine that with such an excellent seeker like Jerry, he will be able to lead Slytherin 100% to win Quidditch in the three years before his graduation. Odd cup of honor. So, it's just a requirement that you don't want to train, of course it can be met. However, I also have a condition, I hope you can promise me. You say. Jerry raised an eyebrow. Marcus said excitedly. Don't tell other people that you became our new seeker, and don't tell others what happened to you here today, I want to give the other three houses a big surprise in this year's Quidditch competition. Jerry thought for a moment and nodded. Okay, no problem. Now that he was good enough in Slater, and Snape had promised to give him a break, Talking about joining the Slytherin team was just icing on the cake. After leaving the Quidditch pitch, Jerry went straight to the library. During this period of time, he has learned a lot of magic knowledge by himself, and he has left a lot of doubts in his heart. Now he also wants to go to the library to search for information and communicate with classmate Hermione by the way. The so-called one person counts short, two counts long, not to mention that Hermione is still such an, ordinary, little magic genius. And not long after Jerry left the Quidditch pitch, Marcus also rushed to Dean Snape's office. He wanted to report Jerry's performance to Dean Snape in detail. Look, Jerry, there's a new spell here, do you want to write it down? In the library, Hermione pointed to a spell that she accidentally saw when she was flipping through the magic book. Certainly. Jerry immediately took out his portable notebook, and recorded the content on the page that read, The Curse of Unleashing the Arrow. Although Hermione and Jerry both read books in the library, their reading directions are somewhat different. Hermione's reading mainly focused on the history and common sense of the wizarding world, as well as some messy and weird knowledge, and she didn't have a special purpose in learning about spells. Jerry's book reading focuses on some magic theories and spells with different functions. However, not all spells are recorded in spell books. There are many spells that are actually hidden in some biographical and historical books. For example, this relatively ancient, Arrow Curse, appeared in a book Hermione was reading about a certain record of Quidditch history. The Arrow Curse is actually a very common offensive spell in the Middle Ages, especially useful against Muggle armies. There is no need for a bow and arrow. With a wave of the wand, the arrow will be shot at the enemy with the wizard's thoughts, and its power is not inferior to that of ordinary strong bows. A powerful wizard can even do a terrifying scene with all arrows. However, due to the secrecy law and policies such as wizards not being able to attack muggles, few people use this spell anymore. In case an arrow flies past and shoots the muggle to death, it's not cost effective to go to Azkaban. And it's not much use against wizards with this spell. 
After all, for a wizard, even if you shoot 10,000 arrows, I can easily solve it with the iron armor curse or the transfiguration curse. It is not as effective as using the body binding curse and sleeping curse. And unless an arrow hits the brain, the wizard can't be shot dead. The wizard is an existence that can recover with magic if it loses an arm or a leg. Therefore, later, the arrow letting curse was only used by wizards to shoot into the sky when watching a Quidditch game to show their support for their favorite team. But later, it was banned because it accidentally shot through the nose of the referee. October 31st, the day before Halloween. Early in the morning, Jerry saw Hagrid, who was like a little titan, and Flitwick, the charms professor, arranging the entire auditorium with magic. Hagrid put magic candles in the hollowed out super big pumpkins one by one, and Professor Flitwick raised the jack-o'-lanterns one by one with a floating spell. Seeing those huge pumpkins floating above the auditorium, Jerry couldn't help but sigh that the gap between him and Professor Level Wizards is really more than a little bit. Professor Flitwick raises hundreds of super jack-o'-lanterns at once and can keep them floating in the air for days without issue. And he used the floating spell to hold a bus in place for only two seconds. However, compared to ordinary young wizards of the same grade who are still using the floating spell to float feathers, he is already very powerful. It may be that a lot of pumpkins were used to make jack-o'-lanterns today, so the breakfast is all pumpkin porridge, which he hates the most. If it weren't for the fact that many professors were having breakfast in the auditorium and could not use magic at will, Jerry really wanted to use the transfiguration technique to turn pumpkin porridge into tofu brains. Slater Lin Yi was in grade 1 and only had class in the morning today, so after getting some sleep in the afternoon, Jerry took a magic book borrowed from the library and sat on the chair in the Slytherin common room to read it. Looking at it, it was around 6 o'clock in the evening. Jerry, the dinner party is about to start, if you don't leave, you will be late. Daphne and Pansy passed by the common room, seeing that the dinner was less than 10 minutes away, Jerry was still sitting in the common room and had no intention of leaving, so he immediately reminded them. Hearing this, Jerry raised his head and smiled gently. It's okay, you go first, I don't like too noisy environment, wait until you finish the last two pages. Seeing this, Daphne and Pansy had no choice but to leave the common room first. Ten minutes later, he put down the magic book in his hand and looked at the time. The dinner party has almost started, everyone should be in the auditorium by now. Getting up and returning to the dormitory, Jerry took out the anesthesia sniper rifle he had retrieved from the room of requirement last night from the big box under the bed, wrapped it in a cloth, and quietly left the Slytherin dormitory. He turned on the Superman mode like a nimble elite agent, and quickly dived towards the stairway connecting the first floor in the basement. The basement of Hogwarts has a large area. In addition to the houseboat near the bottom of the Black Lake, the Slytherin dormitory, the potion classroom, the Slytherin headmaster's office, and the Hufflepuff common room, storage room and kitchen near the bottom of the Great Hall, there are also there are more than a dozen large classrooms that have been abandoned. And if you want to go from the first floor to the basement, except for the special secret passage, there is only the small staircase next to the luxurious marble staircase. Therefore, holding the sniper rifle, Jerry went directly to an unoccupied classroom closest to the small staircase, put his ear against the wall, and began to wait quietly. About 20 minutes later, the sound of footsteps descending the stairs suddenly came from the small staircase behind the wall. Someone is going from the first floor to the basement. The Halloween dinner has already started, and almost all the professors and students, including the headmaster Dumbledore and the night watchman Filch, must be at the dinner party at this time. And now at this time, the only one who will come to the basement from the first floor is Professor Quirrell who is going to release the troll to cause chaos and go to the fourth floor to steal the Philosopher's Stone. When the footsteps were away from the stairs, Jerry picked up the sniper rifle, moved carefully, and came to the door of the classroom. Opening a gap in the wooden door, he took out the mirror he had prepared in advance, and through the reflection of the mirror, he saw the back of Quirrell in a purple turban. At this time, Professor Quirrell was turning his back to him, walking furtively along the corridor of the basement, towards the fifth basement classroom in the distance. Sure enough, it's here. Seeing Quirrell's figure in the mirror, Jerry couldn't help but feel happy. In fact, he had already planned this action for a long time. When he was in the main world, 
he really wanted a small world-like suitcase that Newt had in, Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. One is that with that box, he is equivalent to having a secret base. As a superhero, especially a superhero who does not intend to be controlled by anyone or any force, how can it work if there is no secret base of its own? On the other hand, it is too inconvenient to carry a broomstick every time he goes out. With a space equipment, he can save a lot of worry. However, after his investigation and inquiries during this period of time, boxes like newts are not as easy to obtain as you imagine. Even if you have a lot of galleons, you can't get them through normal channels. Because, similar to space equipment like Newt's suitcase, the main magic used in refining it is the untraceable stretch curse, an advanced spell that can only be learned in 5th and 6th grade. The use of this spell is strictly prohibited by the Ministry of Magic. There are regulations in magic. The magic of the traceless stretching spell, which can expand the space, cannot be used for personal items because of its particularity. It can only be used for the production of individual items approved by the relevant ministry of magic such as school luggage boxes and family tents. Therefore, unless the wizard made it himself in violation of the regulations, he would not be able to buy related products in regular stores. But with Jerry's current level of magic knowledge, it is not easy to learn the advanced spells such as the untraceable stretching curse, even if he obtained the spells through other means. Even if it can be learned, it probably won't expand much space when it is used, let alone the advanced knowledge of alchemy involved. Therefore, he paid attention to the wizards he has come into contact with, who may have such items. In fact, Hogwarts professors may have them in private, but they may not always carry them with them, and it is difficult for him to have a chance to sneak attack. However, there is one person who is an exception. That was Professor Quirrell who taught defense against the dark arts. This professor was once an excellent wizard of Lowen Keluo, and his strength is quite extraordinary, especially his obsession with black magic. However, during a trip to Albania, he met Voldemort's remnant soul, was bewitched by it and became a loyal Death Eater, and even possessed Voldemort's remnant soul. After returning to school, he wrapped Voldemort around the back of his head with a purple turban all day long, and used garlic and other strong-smelling things to cover up Voldemort's decaying smell and began to make up stories about encountering vampires and being frightened by witches, pretending to be a timid person, and lowering everyone's vigilance against him. This time, he took advantage of the fact that everyone, including Headmaster Dumbledore and Night Watchman Filch, was in the Great Hall, and he wanted a person to come to the basement to release the troll and create chaos. The Philosopher's Stone of Resurrection. And Jerry was waiting for this opportunity. Quirrell was able to hide the monster from everyone, and released the giant monster on the basement floor, which means that he must have a space item that can hide the monster at this time. More subtly, Quirrell evades everyone, giving Jerry a chance. The only difficulty is that Quirrell's strength is definitely at the professor level. With his current magical strength, even if it is a sneak attack, it is impossible to defeat Quirrell silently and obtain the space equipment from him. What's more, Quirrell still had Voldemort's soul on the back of his head. Although Voldemort is in the state of a remnant soul at this time and can't do much, but it is Voldemort after all, and who knows what other terrifying means he has. He wants good space equipment, but he doesn't want to die for space equipment. But when he was about to give up, when he used magic to heal the soldiers before, he saw the anesthesia sniper rifle, which rekindled his hope. Quirrell and Voldemort are definitely very vigilant against magic, and they must be very experienced in facing magic attacks, but they certainly don't have much experience in dealing with modern weapons, and they don't even know about them. The key point is that the army's special anesthesia sniper rifle has a range of up to a thousand meters. He can carry out sneak attacks where the opponent can't see. Besides, this is Hogwarts, with Hogwarts in Dumbledore Town, even if Quirrell, a Death Eater, was aware of it, he didn't dare to do anything. If it succeeds, maybe not only a piece of space equipment can be harvested, but also some of Quirrell's private property in the space equipment. Seeing Quirrell disappear into the fifth classroom, Jerry rushed out of the classroom at the top of the stairs, quickly evacuated in the opposite direction, and ambushed in a very suitable sniper spot that he had found in the past few days. This sniper point is a corner position 600 meters away from the stairs, and it is also a visual blind spot. If someone goes downstairs, you can see Jerry's position, 
and Jerry can see the other person, but if someone goes upstairs, then that person will have his back to Jerry, and Jerry can aim at him with a sniper rifle the back. When Professor Quirrell releases the troll, he will definitely return to the auditorium on the first floor to report the news through the stairs, and he can give him a sneak peek. After setting up the sniper rifle, Jerry began to focus on the direction of the stairs through the scope of the sniper rifle. With the blessing of Superman mode, and in addition to the fact that he has also practiced a few times in the response room these days, there should be no major problems with his accuracy. After waiting for about 10 minutes, the back of Professor Quirrell finally appeared in the sight. View. Jerry pulled the trigger decisively. A narcotic sniper bullet spewed out from the muzzle of the gun and in less than two seconds, it traveled a distance of 600 meters and hit Professor Quirrell's ass without any reaction at all. Professor Quirrell, who had just released the giant monster under the stun spell in the fifth classroom, was about to take the stairs back to the auditorium on the first floor for the next step. Suddenly he felt a numbness in his buttocks, and then a feeling of drowsiness so strong that he couldn't stop it came to his heart. Before he could continue to move, his body shook and he fell to the ground. After one hit, Jerry didn't stop at all, and retreated decisively with his gun, and then hid in a nearby abandoned classroom, hiding the sniper rifle in a pile of debris in the classroom. He didn't go up to search Quirrell now, because although Quirrell was fainted, Voldemort was not, and Voldemort should not have much attack power now, but it's better to be careful in everything. Hiding in the abandoned classroom, Jerry quietly listened to the movement outside. Sure enough, about five minutes later, the roar of the troll and the sound of smashing the wooden door with a big stick began to be heard in the distance. Jerry's plan is very simple. Apart from stunning Quirrell with a narcotic sniper rifle, he will not come forward directly, but intends to kill with a knife. Quirrell is good at dealing with trolls, but that doesn't mean he can tame them. What would happen to the awakened troll if he met Professor Quirrell lying unconscious on the ground? I think facing a wizard who stuns himself with magic, the troll must be happy to reward him with a few big pussies, or a few big sticks. If Quirrell was killed by the troll, then Voldemort's remnant must have escaped Hogwarts, and he could have finally appeared to sneak away Professor Quirrell's box. A good Slytherin who missed the dinner party because he was obsessed with reading, found the troll and Professor Quirrell killed by the troll on the way to the first floor. You see, what a normal thing this is. Dumbledore was still in the Great Hall at the moment, and he wasn't afraid of being discovered. Witches have investigative charms to retrace the previous spell cast by a wand, but no spells to retrace an entire event. What's more, Jerry didn't use magic at all in this sneak attack, but used a sniper rifle without talking about magic. As for whether Quirrell's death will affect the subsequent development of the plot, Jerry thinks, what does it matter to him? Dumbledore wants to use the Philosopher's Stone incident to train Harry, that's Dumbledore's business, he only needs to become stronger by himself, and then make a space equipment first. However, although the plan is perfect, it is always difficult to catch up with the changes. Just when Jerry was quietly waiting for the unconscious Professor Quirrell to be killed by a troll in the abandoned classroom, a familiar scream suddenly forced Jerry to temporarily change his plan. Why is Hermione here? Jerry froze when he heard the scream. Yes, there is indeed a scene in the movie where Hermione hid in the women's bathroom on the basement floor and cried because Ron laughed at her for having no friends. Later, he was found by the troll and was almost killed. Fortunately, Harry and Ron arrived in time, and they worked together to restrain the troll. However, when he was eating in the auditorium at noon today, he had obviously checked with Hermione. In the charm class in the morning, Ron did feel ashamed of being corrected by Hermione because of the levitating spell, and said a few outrageous words, but because Hermione had Jerry as a good friend, she was not as sad as in the original book, although she was also a little depressed. And in order to prevent accidents, he even had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Hermione at noon, and enlightened her well. But now, why did Hermione appear in the basement again? What is the situation? Because of Hermione's appearance, Jerry had to temporarily change the plan. But think about it, this is actually not bad, at least it looks more real, and this shot, not only saved Hermione, but also saved Professor Quirrell, and it will definitely be able to earn another wave of reputation. After tidying up his wizard robes, Jerry pretended to have just walked out of the common room, and walked towards the stairs. 
Walking around the corner, the situation on the other side of the stairs also fell into his eyes. At this moment, the troll was standing at the stairs, holding a big stick in his left hand, and Professor Quirrell's ankle in his right hand, like holding a toy, smashing left and right on the ground. This scene made Jerry think of how similar it was to the Green Titan holding Loki in the first episode of Avengers. Hiss, so miserable. Seeing Professor Quirrell's face covered in blood and his eyes blurred, Jerry couldn't help but mourn for him for two seconds. On the stairs opposite the troll, Hermione fell to the ground in fright, screaming and backing away in terror. Apparently, the troll and Professor Quirrell with his face covered in blood, kind of freaked her out. In the final analysis, although Hermione is a top student with a wealth of theoretical knowledge, she is still a little girl with no actual combat experience and no strong combat talent. In a sudden and dangerous situation like today, she is not as effective as Harry and Ron. Hermione, what's going on here? How did Professor Quirrell get caught by a troll? With a surprised expression on my face that I don't know anything, Jerry rushed to the stairs and asked Hermione loudly. Seeing Jerry appear, Hermione calmed down a bit. I don't know, I just drank too much juice and wanted to go to the bathroom in the basement, and that's what I saw. Huh, isn't there a toilet on the first floor, why go to the basement to use the toilet? Jerry was also a little speechless, but he quickly took out his wand and shouted. I'll hold him back first, you go to the auditorium and call the professors to come over. In fact, he didn't know that going to the bathroom was just an excuse for Hermione, she just didn't see Jerry on the long table in Slytherin during the dinner party, and she was worried that something happened to him, so she wanted to go down to the basement to have a look. But I didn't expect that just halfway down the stairs, I saw the cruel scene of the troll below carrying Professor Quirrell with blood on his face. Alright, be careful, I'm going to call the professor and the others over. Hermione hurriedly stood up and went upstairs, rushing towards the auditorium. And at this moment, in Professor Quirrell's wizard robe, which was being carried upside down by the troll, a small box the size of a palm suddenly fell to the ground with a click. Jerry's eyes lit up when he saw the box. With a finger of the wand in his hand, a blue magic light shot straight at the giant monster. A giant monster, a magical animal with a height of about 4 meters, a weight of 1 ton, and only boogers in its brain, is classified as 4x in the textbook, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Jerry, who has experience in fighting more powerful abominations, is certainly not afraid of trolls, and knows their weaknesses. After a sleeping spell temporarily stunned the troll, Jerry stepped forward and grabbed Professor Quirrell, who had fallen from the troll's hand, and pretended to be unintentional, kicking the box that fell on the ground, causing him to he flew directly into the abandoned classroom next to the stairs. Holding the wizard robe of the dying Professor Quirrell, instead of attacking the troll, he fled down the stairs to the first floor. Professor Quirrell was dragged upstairs by Jerry, the back of his head banging on the stairs. In about 7 or 8 seconds, the troll woke up and was about to go up the stairs with a big stick, but he put a stun spell on him again. Dragging Professor Quirrell to the first floor, Jerry also saw Professor Snape, Professor McGonagall and the school doctor Mrs. Pomrath who had rushed over. It turned out that just when Hermione rushed into the auditorium, she yelled out that a troll appeared in the basement, that Professor Quirrell was stunned and fell into the troll's hands, and that Jerry was trying to save Professor Quirrell from the troll's hands. Dumbledore immediately dispatched Professor Snape, Professor McGonagall and the school doctor Palm River. Mr. Carmen, are you all right? McGonagall looked at Jerry nervously. Although Jerry is not a Gryffindor, Professor McGonagall attaches equal importance to the safety of every little wizard. I'm fine, but I'm afraid Professor Quirrell is not well, and the troll is still on the first floor, and my sleeping curse probably won't stop him for a few seconds. Jerry pointed to Quirrell whose face was covered in blood on the ground. Snape glanced at Quirrell with some doubts, and then told Jerry in a slightly appreciative tone. Jerry, you are very good. Follow Professor McGonagall back to the auditorium first, and I will go down and deal with that giant monster. Professor Quirrell to me, I will take him to treatment. At this time, Mrs. Pomriver waved her wand, and Professor Quirrell's body followed her to the school infirmary under the effect of her moving spell. 
The moving spell is similar to the floating spell, except that it can not only make objects float, but also move with the wizard's thoughts under the control of the wizard's wand. Of course, unlike the levitating spell, which can be ignored after it is cast, the moving spell must continuously release its magic power, and it cannot be too far away from the wizard, otherwise it will be impossible to control it. Mr. Carmen, why are you alone in the basement? On the way back to the auditorium, Professor McGonagall asked with some doubts. For this question, Jerry is also well prepared. I was so engrossed in reading in the common room that I missed the start of the dinner party by the time I realized it. He had been reading in the common room this afternoon, where many little Slytherin wizards could sit, and just before the dinner party, he ran into Daphne and Pansy. McGonagall nodded, she wasn't suspicious, just curious. Mr. Carmen, you performed very well just now. If you hadn't bravely held back the troll, Miss Granger and Professor Quirrell would be in danger. I'll give Slytherin ten points for your bravery. Quote. In fact, Professor McGonagall has always been impressed with Jerry, a little wizard. From the very beginning when she saw Jerry bravely stand up for the bullied and weak in the orphanage, she felt that Jerry was very suitable for Gryffindor. For the most important quality of a Gryffindor is bravery. Unfortunately, I didn't expect Jerry to be directly assigned to Slytherin by the sorting hat at the sorting ceremony. Thank you Professor McGonagall. Jerry responded with a smile. Although Snape treated him very well, he had to admit that Professor McGonagall was indeed a model among the entire Hogwarts professors in terms of fairness and justice. Call. Following Professor McGonagall into the auditorium, except for the little wizard of Slytherin and Hermione, as well as Flitwick, the Dean of Lowen Kelluo, and Sprout, the Dean of Hufflepuff, there was no Dumbledore in the auditorium. Jerry also breathed a sigh of relief. Presumably, the young wizards from other colleges should have returned to the dormitory under the leadership of the prefects, and Dumbledore most likely went to check his philosopher's stone. Although there was a little accident in this plan, the result is still good. The only loophole is probably Dumbledore's legilimency. If Dumbledore activates legilimency on him, it will be very troublesome. Although, he thinks that possibility is not very great. During the return period, as long as Jerry has no classes, he will basically spend time in the library. After rummaging through many magic books, he finally saw the relevant introduction in a book, about legilimency and legilimency mantra. In fact, as a relatively advanced and dangerous spell, legilimency does not exist in the seven-year teaching textbooks of Hogwarts. Even in the school library, there are only relevant introductions, but no specific learning methods. Of course, it might be in the restricted area, but he hasn't been there, and he doesn't know. In this book, about legilimency practitioners and legilimency mantras, he learned that legilimency is divided into two types, legilimency practitioners and legilimency mantras. Legilimency is a wizard born with the ability of legilimency, that is, they don't need to learn, they can read other people's minds by birth. It's just that this kind of natural legilimency seems to be not easy to control because of its strong mental power. If there are too many people nearby, it will be very painful. Jerry thinks it should be like the American wizard named Queenie Goldstein in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. The legilimency mantra is a spell that any wizard can learn, specially researched and invented by the legilimency practitioners a long time ago by studying their own legilimency ability. Just look into the other person's eyes and chant the mantra of legilimency, and you can read the thoughts in the other person's mind at this time, and even read the other person's memory along the way. And a wizard who has practiced legilimency and chanting to an extremely advanced level is also called a master of legilimency. Like Dumbledore, Voldemort, and Snape. They don't need spells, as long as they look at you, they can immediately know what's on your mind. If you want to completely fight against this kind of legilimency, you must learn the opposite occlumency. Or, you can also choose not to make eye contact with him, and focus your thoughts on other things, so that the other party cannot successfully invade the memory, but the specific effect of this is not clearly stated in the book. However, Jerry thinks there should still be some effect. Otherwise, wouldn't Dumbledore understand all of Voldemort's sins at school with a single glance? Jerry, are you okay? Hermione watched Jerry return safely with Professor McGonagall, and immediately ran up excitedly and hugged him. 
The scene just now was too scary, and she finally felt relieved when she saw that her best friend was not injured. Now all the Gryffindors followed the prefect back to the common room, only she stayed alone because she was worried about Jerry's safety. Originally, this was not allowed, but Hermione was the messenger and also an eyewitness, and she would definitely need to describe the whole incident in detail later, so Professor Flitwick, who stayed behind, agreed. I'm fine, except that Professor Quirrell was seriously injured and was taken away by Mrs. Palmley for treatment. Jerry froze for a moment, then patted Hermione on the shoulder with a smile. On the other side, Daphne and the Slytherin team immediately pouted when she saw this, and let out a cold snort. At this time, Snape also walked into the Great Hall. Obviously, for a wizard of his level, it didn't take much effort to deal with a troll. What really matters is figuring out where the troll came from in the basement, and where did the troll break into Hogwarts Castle. However, after careful questioning, the four directors found that neither Hermione nor Jerry knew how the troll appeared on the basement floor. Hermione is the troll and Professor Quirrell encountered at the stairs on the first floor of the dungeon, and Jerry only appeared after leaving the common room and hearing Hermione's scream. So, if you want to know what's going on, you have to ask Professor Quirrell, who was the first to contact the troll. However, we have to wait for Mrs. Pontrell to stabilize Professor Quirrell's injury before asking. In fact, when answering the question, in order to prevent Snape from using legilimency to himself, Jerry deliberately did not meet Snape's eyes, and also turned on the Superman mode, forcing his brain to repeat his own rhetoric. However, according to Snape's expression he inadvertently observed, the other party probably didn't use legilimency spell on him. That's right, anyone with quality should not casually peep into other people's hearts, and besides the fact that the sniper rifle was hidden in his speech just now, everything else is true, and there is nothing doubtful about it. After listening to Jerry and Hermione's statement, Professor McGonagall repeated that he would give Jerry 10 points, which made all the little wizards in Slytherin cheer. To Jerry's surprise, Snape unexpectedly added three points to Hermione. The reason was that Hermione had informed the professors of what had happened on the basement floor in a timely manner, which deserved a reward. After everything was over, Professor McGonagall personally sent Hermione back to the Gryffindor common room, and Snape also brought the little Slytherin wizards back to the Slytherin common room. Professor Flitwick and Professor Sprout patrol the castle to see if any other trolls have broken into the castle. 12 o'clock at night, Jerry got up quietly and left the dormitory. From the two abandoned classrooms, he retrieved the tranquilizer sniper rifle and the small box dropped from Professor Quirrell's wizard robe. Then turn on the Superman mode and carefully go to the room of response on the 8th floor. During this period, he met Mrs. Norris who was on patrol. However, under the effect of catnip powder, Mrs. Norris did not cause him any trouble. Inside the House of Requirements, Jerry put the anesthetic sniper rifle back behind the bust of the wizard, and then took out the small palm-sized box with some expectation, and slowly opened it. It's really a magic space equipment made with alchemy. Holding the box in front of his eyes, through the palm-sized box, he seemed to lift a cloud in the sky. Through the hole under the cloud, he saw an open space about the size of a football field, and there was a typical building, small English cottage. How do you get in such a small hole? Looking at the hole that was only the size of a palm, and then looking at his own body shape, Jerry felt a little bit difficult. But after thinking about it, since Professor Quirrell can release a giant monster 3 to 4 meters high from such a small hole, his size doesn't seem to be a big deal. Putting the opened box on the ground, Jerry imitated the way Newt entered the world of suitcases in the movie, stretched his foot towards the opening of the box, and then thought that I would go in. Sure enough, a wave of spatial fluctuation appeared above the box, and his foot actually protruded into the space inside the box. There was a ladder about 8 or 9 meters long at the entrance of the box. After one of his feet went in, he stepped on the ladder. After standing firmly on the ladder, he immediately lifted the other foot outside, and also stretched into the space of the box. Just like that, walking down the ladder, soon, his figure completely disappeared in the box, leaving only the palm-sized box left alone on the ground of the room of requirement. All the way down the ladder, soon Jerry's feet were on the soft green lawn. He raised his head and carefully looked around the space inside the box, and blurted out with a sigh. 
The needle does not rub. A luminous sphere floats above the space, illuminating the entire box space brightly. It is estimated that it is a magic item similar to a little sun made by alchemy combined with the lighting spell. In addition to a piece of green lawn on the ground, a small area was specially planned and a lot of precious herbs were planted. Some of them he'd seen in, a thousand wonderful herbs and fungi, and some he didn't know at all. There is also a reservoir next to the medicine field, and the water in it is crystal clear. There are also some trees planted around, and the overall look is like a small villa with a huge yard. Walking along the green lawn into the small villa, this is a very common classical English villa in the wizarding world, with some Victorian styles. Opening the door is a long foyer, the floor is covered with a purple carpet, stepping on the carpet through the foyer into the hall, you will see a beautiful fireplace and various carved furniture. Obviously, Professor Quirrell was one of the richer wizards. The entire villa has two floors, the first floor is mainly the entrance hall, hall, kitchen, dining room and magic laboratory. The magic laboratory, or the potion refining room is more suitable. In addition to a whole set of valuable potion refining equipment, there is also a large cabinet that stores various potion materials. And, some already refined magic potions that Jerry knows or doesn't know. It seems that although Professor Quirrell is not a potion master, he also has a lot of accomplishments in potion refining. Also, wizards who generally like to study black magic, the level of potion refining is not too low. The second floor is mainly composed of three bedrooms, a living room and a bathroom. After a careful search, Jerry found Professor Quirrell's reserve of a thousand gold galleons on the entire second floor, and a notebook of Professor Quirrell's research on black magic. Among them, what surprised Jerry the most was that in this notebook, Professor Quirrell actually recorded the experience of learning the three unforgivable curses, the Crucitus Curse, the Imperious Curse and the Killing Curse. In addition, there is the Fierce Fire Curse, which is very difficult to control, and some curses that are not particularly common. It can be said to be full of gains. When he was in the main world, Jerry never worried about money, because with his magical ability, it is not too difficult to really get money. But in the world of wizards, everyone knows magic, and he is still a novice magician. If he wants to get a large number of galleons so smoothly, it will be a little troublesome. He has thought about using some capital and financial means to make money. But on the one hand, he is not very proficient in these things, on the other hand, his age, time and strength and other aspects do not allow it. As a first-year little wizard, now he mainly focuses on learning magic, and he can't leave school. Moreover, if you attack the existing rule system at will, without the support of certain strength and influence, the consequences will definitely not be optimistic. Later, he thought of the eight-eyed spider in the Forbidden Forest, the venom of the giant spider, which was a precious item worth 100 galleons per pint. But considering that the Acromantula is marked as dangerous at XXXXX level in the textbook of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find It, and their number, he thinks it's better to forget it for the time being. Although Harry and Ron were not hurt in the movie when they stood out from the siege of countless Acromantulas, it was because they were the protagonists. The level of danger at the XXXXX level is the same level as that of the Fire Dragon, which means that if ordinary elite wizards encounter it alone, if they don't react fast enough, they will be overturned. Although giant eight-eyed spiders are not as powerful as fire dragons, they have intelligence no less than that of humans, and they live in groups, and their venom is very deadly. Therefore, finding a thousand gold galleons in Professor Quirrell's box is still very urgent for Jerry. Of course, Professor Quirrell's black magic notes are actually much more valuable than a thousand gold galleons. As long as Jin Gallon thinks of a way and is willing to spend time, it is not impossible to make money, but black magic such as the three unforgivable curses and fierce fire curse, as well as Professor Quirrell's experience on these advanced spells, cannot be bought by Jin Gallon. Arrived. With Professor Quirrell's black magic notes, I believe that even if there is no one to guide him, he can learn to master it slowly by just refreshing his mind and taking time to study on his own. The Crucitus Curse tortures information, the Imperious Curse controls the mind, the Killing Curse kills, and the Fierce Fire Curse attacks and clears the field. After mastering these four black arts, his magic strength will definitely increase a lot. If you encounter an abomination next time, you may not need hard steel at all, and an Imperious Curse will do it. 
This wave is really not a loss. After returning to the response room again, he put the small box in his pocket, and Jerry felt that although his plan to attack Professor Quirrell this time had some dangers and loopholes, it was really worth it. If you don't take some risks, how can you get rich overnight? After Halloween, because of the hype among Slytherin wizards, everyone knows that their defense against the dark arts class teaches Quirrell. He was stunned and seriously injured by a giant monster, but he survived thanks to the first-year Slytherin freshman Jerry Carmen. Therefore, all the wizards in Hogwarts, apart from knowing that the famous Harry Potter came to the first grade this year, they also know that among the first graders in Slytherin this year, there is a very good little wizard Jerry Carmen. The name of Jerry Carmen has also gradually spread from the original first-year freshman to the eyes of other senior wizards. Maybe they don't know who Jerry Kamen is yet, but at least they already know the name. In this way, the time came to November. After entering November, the weather becomes very cold. The mountains around the school are gray and covered with ice and snow, and the surface of the Black Lake is as cold and hard as tempered steel. Every morning there is frost on the ground. During this time, Jerry also studied magic knowledge crazily. In addition to attending classes and eating during the day, he spent most of his time searching for various materials in the library. Or go to Snape to ask some incomprehensible magic principles, and discuss some magic extensions and spell applications with Hermione. At night, I quietly go to the response room to practice and study black magic. Or occasionally take time to enter the small villa in the box space, try to follow some potion formulas found in the library, and go back to practice making some potions. In short, Jerry feels that he lives every day extremely fulfilling, learning new things every day, making progress, and becoming stronger. Except for the astonishing consumption of Little Red Star, everything else is very good. However, before he came in this time, he had accumulated more than 50,000 Little Red Stars. Even if it was consumed quickly, it should be enough for him to last until the end of this semester. The editor has already decided to put it on the shelves this Friday, and it will definitely be updated at that time. I hope that book friends will support you a lot. Also, thank you, Uncle Jerry, for your daily rewards. He is already the rudder of this book, woo woo woo, I'm touched, only after it's put on the shelves, I will thank you. Saturday morning, wearing a green Slytherin scarf, Jerry walked into the auditorium as usual. As soon as he entered the door, his eyes lit up, and a strong smell of grilled sausages entered his nostrils. In terms of the various breakfasts in Hogwarts, his favorite is the big grilled sausage, mainly because there is really a lot of meat in it. He uses the refreshing function a lot every day, which consumes not only the little red star, but also the energy in his body. So if possible, he hopes that he can eat meat every day, and have high sugar snacks and drinks every day to supplement the energy he consumes every day. If other little wizards have observed Jerry's eating carefully, they can actually find that he tries to maintain an elegant posture while eating. However, he may eat several times more food per meal than a normal adult. Even Gore and Crab, who are super edible, actually eat far less than half of Jerry's food. There will also be a phenomenon, if there is nothing to do, Jerry will be the last to leave the table every time. Jerry, will you watch the Quidditch match at noon? Just as Jerry sat down, before he had time to pick up a big sausage, Daphne who was opposite suddenly asked him expectantly. Of course, today it's Slytherin versus Gryffindor. Jerry smiled and gave an affirmative answer. In fact, with his character, if he had half a day to watch a group of young wizards playing on broomsticks, he might as well study the three unforgivable curses. It has been a week since he got the three unforgivable curses, and he still has no way to successfully release them. However, there is no way, who let him be the Slytherin team's seeker, one of the two sides in today's match is the Slytherin team, so he still has to participate. Moreover, just two days before he joined the Slytherin team, Snape had given him the promised newest Nimbus 2000. Besides, if Snape hadn't helped him resolve many doubts during this period of time, his magic progress would definitely not have been so fast. For you, this is a small flag that symbolizes our Slytherin. We can wave the small flag together and cheer for Slytherin. Hearing that Jerry was going to visit the competition, Daphne immediately took out the green flag she had prepared earlier from below, and handed it to Jerry with burning eyes. 
In fact, in a normal situation like this when there are teams from the academy participating in the competition, there would hardly be any young wizard who would not watch. But Daphne still asked Jerry in advance. The main thing is Jerry's usual performance, it is really possible to do such a thing. In the eyes of all the little Slytherin wizards, Jerry is very good, good at almost all subjects, very polite to everyone, perfect. The only fly in the ointment is that Jerry seldom, or never at all, participated in group activities held privately by the little wizards of Slytherin. Except when you are sleeping in class, whenever you see Jerry, he is definitely reading. It's just that the location is different, sometimes it's in the library, sometimes it's in the common room, and sometimes it's on the meadow under the sunset by the Black Lake. In short, apart from studying, Jerry doesn't seem to have any other hobbies. But it was also true that many Slytherins, including the little Malfoy who was a little unhappy with Jerry, admired him very much in their hearts. This also led to Daphne thinking that Jerry may not necessarily watch Slytherin's Quidditch match. Okay, thank you, classmate Daphne. Jerry froze for a moment, then took the small green flag naturally. After a while, he will play directly, but this small flag will not be available. However, he promised Marcus to keep the fact that he became a seeker secret, and it was difficult to explain anything. At 11 o'clock in the morning, almost all the professors and little wizards came to the Quidditch pitch. On the stands in the east, west, north, south, and four directions of the entire stadium, there were four little wizards from the academy standing with clear banners, and each of them wore a scarf that belonged to their own academy. Gryffindor is red and yellow, red represents fire, a symbol of bravery. Slytherin is a green room, green represents water, a symbol of blood. Hufflepuff is yellow and black, yellow represents earth, a symbol of kindness. Lewen Keluos is the blue Baishyang room, blue represents air, and symbolizes wisdom. In order to prevent the little wizards from being unable to see the scene of the game clearly, some of the stands were raised into the air with a powerful levitation spell at this time, but many little wizards still brought binoculars. In the middle of the stands, there were some wooden towers that were a little higher than ordinary stands. These towers were filled with school professors, commentators, and some non-school wizards who came from Hogsmeade Village to watch the game. What are you looking for? In the Slytherin stands, Pansy watched Daphne looking around, as if she was looking for someone. Jerry, he said that he would come to watch the game when he had dinner in the morning, why hasn't he seen anyone else until now? Daphne couldn't help frowning, she also wants to cheer for Team Slytherin with Jerry. Panshi covered her mouth and laughed. Jerry, it's not like you don't know. Maybe that guy forgot the time while reading a book. Did you forget the last Halloween dinner? Don't worry, Quidditch matches usually take two to three hours to end, and he will definitely come before the end of the game. Quote. Okay. When Daphne heard this, she had no choice but to nod her head, and turned her gaze to the center of the competition. At the same time, in the Slytherin team locker room, Jerry, who had already changed into a green Quidditch robe, stood calmly in front of the exit. Jerry, don't be nervous for a while, as long as you can play at the same level as last time, oh no, as long as you can play at one-tenth of the level last time, we can win for sure. The captain Marcus on the side encouraged Jerry nervously. Although Marcus was shocked by Jerry's performance last time, he knew that there was still a difference between private training and real competition on the field. After all, in the real arena, with so many people watching, if the mental quality is not up to standard, it is easy for the level to drop sharply, or even become too nervous to compete. After all, Jerry is only a first-year freshman. Even though he is very talented, but has never experienced a game, Marcus is still a little worried. Especially since Jerry hasn't participated in their training even once. Captain, you look more nervous than me, don't worry, I won't let you down. Jerry looked up and gave Marcus a reassuring look. He doesn't have time to waste two or three hours here, it's the right thing to finish early, to call it a day and go back to study magic. There are seven players in a Quidditch game, three chasers, two batters, a keeper, and a seeker. Three of the chasers are responsible for scrambling for the quaffle and throwing it into the opponent's hoop to score a goal, scoring 10 points. The two hitters are responsible for knocking the aggressive bludgers into the air, escorting their own players, or better yet, hitting the opposing player if the technique allows. The goalkeeper guards the goal, 
preventing opposing players from throwing the quaffle into one of their three scoring hoops. And the most important thing is the seeker, he is responsible for catching the golden snitch. After catching the golden snitch, the game is over, and at the same time, he will get a full 150 points. Therefore, under normal circumstances, whichever team seeker catches the snitch first basically wins. After all, unless the strength of the team members on one side is much worse than that of the other side, it is impossible to have such a big gap of 150. However, the snitch is not so easy to catch. In history, there have even been tragic situations where the game was held for several days because the seekers on both sides could not catch the snitch. Slater Lynn has been able to suppress Gryffindor before, because Gryffindor's seeker is not as strong as his seeker, and every time his seeker catches the snitch first. In fact, in the previous games, before Slater's seeker caught the snitch, Gryffindor's score was ahead of Slytherin's, but the gap was not as big as 150. You know, Gryffindor's pursuers and hitters are very strong, especially the captain of the Gryffindor team who just graduated last year, the most powerful chaser Charlie Weasley. It is said that Charlie Weasley was invited by the British Quidditch team when he graduated, but he refused. If Jerry can't play normally, causing the opposite seeker to catch the snitch first, then this game against the Gryffindor team will be in danger. The seven-year record of defeating those reckless Gryffindors was about to end at the hands of his current captain. That's why Marcus is more nervous than Jerry himself right now. Now, let's invite two teams to enter. The Quidditch match commentator, Lee Jordan, a Gryffindor third-year wizard, announced loudly at this time with the amplifying charm. As his voice fell, the cheering shouts of the little wizards came from outside like a tsunami. Okay, time is up, good luck to everyone. Marcus stepped on his broomstick and flew out first, followed by Jerry on the Nimbus 2000, and the five team members behind. On the playing field, the Gryffindor team wearing bright red Quidditch robes and the Slytherin team wearing dark green robes quickly flew out from both ends of the entire Quidditch pitch. Then he waved his hands coquettishly in the sky, and then slowly landed on both sides of Ms. Huchu was already standing in the center of the arena. The atmosphere at the scene reached a climax immediately. Gryffindor, Slytherin, the shouts became more and more one after another. But obviously, the voice of cheering for Gryffindor is far louder than the voice of cheering for Slytherin. No way, in terms of popularity, the brave and enthusiastic Gryffindor is more attractive than the arrogant and contemptuous Slytherin. So in addition to their respective houses, the cheers of Wenclaw and Hufflepuff were mostly given to Gryffindor. But when they looked carefully at the players on both sides of the field, they found something was wrong. That is, the seeker of the Slytherin team is not Terence Higgs who has not changed for four years, but a new face, a little wizard who obviously looks like a first or second year. That's, Jerry. How did he become Slater's seeker? At this moment in the Slytherin stands, Daphne and all the Slater wizards let out an exclamation at the same time. On the other side of the Gryffindor stand, Hermione, Harry and Ron, who were familiar with Jerry, also let out similar exclamations. Jerry, it turned out to be Jerry, Hermione, did you know that Jerry became a first-year seeker? I don't know, but it's impossible. He reads in the library with me every weekend, and has never been to the Quidditch pitch for training. Hearing Harry and Ron's inquiry, Hermione shook her head in disbelief. Oh. Merlin's beard, we found out that Slytherin has actually changed their seeker. They boldly used a new seeker. Can anyone tell me the name of this new seeker? At this time, the voice of the commentator Lee Jordan came again from the tower stand. What? His name is Jerry Carmen, is that the Jerry who saved Professor Quirrell from the troll? But, if I remember correctly, he should be a freshman. Slytherin's bold use of first-year freshmen, is it a bold and arrogant move, or is there some special reason, let us wait and see. Quote. Under Lee Jordan's explanation, all the little wizards knew that this new seeker was the Slytherin freshman who saved Professor Quirrell from the troll on Halloween a week ago. They had only heard of Jerry's name before, but not all of them had seen Jerry. Now the whole of Hogwarts, including the wizards in Hogsmeade, knew him. However, at this time, most people are not very optimistic about replacing Terence Higgs, who has five years of experience, and using a freshman as the most important seeker. Especially the senior wizards of Slytherin, most of them frowned. On the field, Wood of the Gryffindor team whispered to the players with some excitement. 
Play hard for a while, we will win this game. Listen, I want everyone to play the game fairly and honestly. With a silver whistle in one hand and a broom in the other, Ms. Hooch glanced at both teams, especially Slytherin and Captain Marcus. Because this guy often fell because of his strength and size in previous games. After finishing speaking, she picked up the silver whistle and blew fiercely. Immediately, all the players of the two teams rose into the sky. The quaffle was immediately picked up by Angelina Johnson of Gryffindor, what a chaser that girl is, and she's pretty good looking. The voice of Lee Jordan's commentary sounded again. The snitch was released, Merlin, it was so fast, it disappeared in a blink of an eye, oh, our Slytherin is looking for the ball, did he find the snitch? Oh, Merlin's underpants, what did I see, I must be dazzled, how could that be, Jerry, Slytherin's new seeker, he caught catch, caught the snitch. It has been less than a minute since the golden snitch was released. This is probably the fastest game in Quidditch history. Quote, thanks for watching, please subscribe and support my channel.